we have to go all out on nuclear. We have to use it. It's a magic energy. As Einstein and Marie Curie and Fermi said, it's a magic energy. We've got to be smart about it. It's got uses everywhere. Uh, it's, it's the primary solution. The chemical damage to, the, to our landscape all over the world from oil is, is huge. People don't admit it. They don't see it. And they go on about radioactive waste, which is the most supervised of all. You can fit all the radioactive waste we've used up to date in, inside a Walmart. You know, it's high, highly supervised and it decays. Within 40 years, 99% of it is, is toxicity is gone. I wish we could bring Einstein back or Enrico Fermi and see what they'd say. What idiots, you know, they, they'd be saying what a historical tragedy this is that you let your ignorant people lead our society into this restriction where you cut off the, uh, what Prometheus gave us. You know, this is a gift to mankind, a gift. Use nuclear well. It's part of the earth. Well, I wish that we had intelligent people to lead our society, but we don't. I appreciate you coming back to the show. I I was surprised actually to see this documentary pop up and I've been a fan of nuclear power for some time and I'm always surprised by the ridiculous, in my opinion, ridiculous amount of pushback that I get on this. And your documentary made it really clear that it's just about fear being drilled into us at an early age. Fear, yeah, subconscious. Horror films from the 50s, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, People conflate the bomb with nuclear power. It's a big difference. They don't understand that a bomb is an enriched uranium, really enriched, up to 90%. Uh, and a, a nuclear power is like 2 3%. So it's, it's not, not even close. It takes a lot of work to make a bomb, huge amount of work. And as you know from people, it's not that easy to build a bomb. So, and a dirty bomb is not radioactive the same way. Uh, so it's, it's all this... So much sensationalism around it. I came to it as an observer from the outside. I didn't know much about it. I was vaguely uh, for against nuclear power in the 70s, 80s, because it made sense. You know, Jane Fonda was for it, uh, against it, and Springsteen and Jackson Brown and Ralph Nader, people I admired. And I think they really believed what they, they were doing because... We don't, I don't want to get into the because, but they really were scared of it. Uh, you know, the founder and then all the environmental groups kicked in starting in 1970, 70, yeah, with uh, Greenpeace and, and uh, Friends of the Earth, which was one of the first groups, uh, Friends of the Earth. And they, they spread the stories about how dangerous radioactivity was based on the old Rockefeller report from the 1956 Rockefeller Foundation put out. They were highly, you know, Rockefeller for fossil fuels, I mean, standard oil. And uh, <clears throat> they put out this report in 56 that said any amount, any amount of radioactivity is, dam is, is harmful to the body. It's yeah, just not true. Yeah. It's just not true. And scientifically, it's been debunked, as have many other myths, but it's continued into the subconscious process. Uh, I'd love to, I, we'll, we'll unpack a lot of that. I, I do want to sort of back up and find out how this all began. The beginning of the anti-nuclear movement, you say in the documentary, Earth Day 1970, pollution fears. It just seems like, it looks a little bit like the Hollywood cause du jour, like you mentioned, Jane Fonda was against it. It just took on a life of its own. And it reminded me of, what was that? I'm sorry, I'm probably showing my age here. That concert, was it Live Aid? Where they were like, we got to give all this stuff to Africa. And it turned out like, oh, that, well, that was didn't later, do anything. Wasn't? That was 1980s, I think. That was the 80s, yeah. yeah. Was, this, but but yeah. this reminds me of that thing, kind though. of same thing. Well, it's yeah, but it's that was Ethiopia f famine, the famine there. That was right. significant famine. And I think they did a lot of good. They raised a lot of money. It's, it's Sometimes charity gets confusing, you know, because... Mm -hmm. You try to do some good and you end up doing more harm than you do good. Uh, no, this is a 1970s movement and it came out of basically, you know, you could argue that it came from the World War II, the use of the nuclear discovery, which was amazing discovery, by the way. It was, it's the foundation of the universe. It's one of the most powerful energies we ever had. Marie Curie in 19, 1895 found it. And it was a movie made with Greer Garson. You should see it. It's very interesting movie about 
what radioactivity really was in the beginning. And she saw the power of it. And uh, Enrico Fermi did. Einstein did. Einstein said matter is energy. He understood this. And he understood what nuclear could do. So did uh, Fermi was able to control it in his experiments in Chicago. Enrico Fermi, the Italian uh, nuclear scientist, he really did a great job of showing what, what uranium could be controlled. And that is the key because people are scared of, uh, as I said earlier, enriched uranium is dangerous. No question about it. But uh, the radiation in a, nu- in a nuclear energy facility is background radiation. It's lower level. And it's not to be scared of. It's just to be handled correctly as you would any toxic material in chemistry or I mean, all our industries are based in some degree on materials that are toxic. And we have to arsenic and lead and all kinds of cadmium, all kinds of poisonings that are going on. But if you handle this correctly, as has been proven for 60 years now in the nuclear industry, you have no problem. You just handle it correctly. And that includes the waste, too. It was no big deal. Sure. Sure. I think th- the problem is when you get all these demonstrations and you have these drills where you stick your head between your legs and go under your desk, you get scared. And people don't think well when they are scared. One of the missions of this podcast is to unscare people. But the problem is that it's so much easier to scare people than it is to unscare people. And nuclear falls into that category. I know. Well, this is the nature of human life. We, the negative is always more damaging than the positive. Something comes out and mm-hmm. you say something positive. Oh, great, great. But then when you say something negative, it has more impact. Uh, this is true about movies too. You know, one bad review can spoil, uh, one bad review can spoil 10 good reviews. Uh, it's, uh, the, the negativity in mankind is, is a subject that you, is, we could talk about forever, I think. It, it runs through the human race. And I've, I, it's been my enemy for my life. It's cynicism. But I, I really, I didn't know anything about this subject. I came to it as a father and as a citizen. 1970s, it seemed like it was the right thing to do. But by the 2000s, when we started to hear about climate change, it, it, it became, this became more uh, mature as an idea. It became mm-hmm. the idea that climate change is really happening because of fossil fuel poisoning fossil fuel and that's coal and oil and gas, uh, all the stuff that we put into the atmosphere, it's out there. That's the danger. That's the poison of the world. It's far more significant than any amount of radioactive waste. And that's... Is, is that beeping thing? Yeah, that's, that that's unfortunately my phone here. I'm sorry. I'll turn it off. Oh, okay. Let's turn it. Yeah. yeah. But we're good for that stuff, right? Yeah, we, we, yeah, we'll 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 sort of cut around the. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> hey, it's okay to have that in a. In a in, you have to have some uh, mistakes in life, and that includes uh, nuclear energy. You have to have some accidents in anything. You, you you invent an airplane, it crashes, and you know we can give up on airplanes and say we're never going to fly again. Same mm-hmm. thing is true about anything that we comes into being there are downsides, but we always make the po- the best of it. And that's what happened with nuclear. We made the best of it. Eisenhower understood it. And uh, so did um, John Kennedy. They really pushed it. And it, it, we would have been a nuclearized society by 2000, 2020, in the United States anyway. And I think we would have led the rest of the world in, in adapting it. And it, that was what was happening. Russia was also doing it and doing it very well, by the way. And they stayed with it. They didn't give it up. Uh, even after Chernobyl, so uh, Russia is a good is a good example. As is China now. China has come into its own and is building huge amounts of uh, nuclear reactors, but they have, too are using a lot of coal. Yeah, so, they're building coal yeah, too. Unfortunately, but at least they're yeah. on the right track, and they can. They and President Xi has promised to go to net zero by 2060, and that's significant. I really yeah, do he'll hope still they be come president through then. It. Yeah. Well, listen, <laughs> listen, sometimes uh, if you change administrations all the time and you have different policies like the United States has had, well, not with nuclear, it's true, but you, you can't just change policies all the time. That's part of the problem of so-called democracies. But uh, with nuclear energy, it's been the same. We have Bush, uh, Obama, uh, Trump, and Biden have all been pro-nuclear, and but they haven't put the energy into it, the, the, the word of mouth, the, the symbolism of it. They don't, I don't think that they, they've been scared off by all the 
alarmists and the yeah. money, the cost factors in the United States are significant. Yeah. But we're not, well, I'm not talking in the movie about just the United States. I'm talking about the world here. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're looking at an issue that is coming into being by 2050. Uh, there's going to be a demand for more and more electricity, which is about two, three, four times more. And we're not ready for it. And, we're, and, and because most of the societies are poor, they're going to end up using more coal and even wood if necessary. That is, yeah, that stuff terrifies me. By the way, the explanation in the movie or the documentary of the fuel used is really something. And I want to highlight this. An amount of uranium the size of the tip of your pinky finger, that amount of uranium is like $2 to to mine. And I don't know how the, what else they do. Do they enrich it? They pack it together into the imaginary pinky finger that I'm envisioning in my brain. And then in this uranium has the same energy as about $100 worth of coal, which is about a metric ton of coal. And I probably don't have to really describe how much more burning that coal pollutes than using that yeah. uranium. There's nothing like nothing like uh, nuclear energy, nothing like it in the world. It's got the most powerful thing of all. I don't, it's a gift from the gods. It's, if you, if Prometheus, I mean, it's truly a gift of fire. And the beauty of Fermi's experiment, you remember with the rods, he shows you how uranium yeah. can be controlled. And that got lost. It got lost in transition somewhere along the line. And ignorant people, a lot of them were good people, uh, environmental groups, you know, but they, they didn't know what they were talking about. They just made, the, one of the best moments in the film, I think, is when the co-founder of Greenpeace, uh, Dr. Moore, comes on and he says, you know, we got a lot of things right. Save the whales, uh, stopping the bombs, uh, cleaning up the concept of, but we got one thing wrong. It was nuclear energy. He says it very clearly, but many of his people have come along with it. There are people who have converted from environmentalists into pro, nu- pro nuclear green environmentalists, but many of them have not. And they continue to be the Green Party in Europe, in Germany, for example, they closed down several nu- nuclear reactors and they went back to. To fossil fuels, it was insane, and uh, and and also the United States. They closed it down essentially, not really completely, but they closed it down essentially with the uh, Three Mile Island incident and then the Chernobyl incident in 1986, which was a, a genuine accident. But it's understandable, and we know how what happened. But there was no reason to run away, and we did. We we basically froze in place, as did Japan after Fukushima and uh, Korea. So, uh, but now we're back on track. I think people are beginning to understand the polling in the United States. So 60% of the population is pro-nuclear. I'm glad the, to hear that. The problem is the money doesn't get there. I mean, we, there is money being put in, but it's, they're, they're still banking on renewables more, which is unfortunately very expensive, but nothing wrong with wind and nothing wrong with sun, but they don't work all the time. And that's they don't work pe- all the time. People yeah. don't. And what do they use as a backup? They use gas. Coal. Yeah. Or gas, oil. Gas. Yeah. yeah. Mostly gas uh, in the United States, which is methane. And that leaks all along the line. It goes up into the atmosphere. Very dangerous, very dangerous and poisonous, toxic. And then they talk about radioactive waste compared to, uh, compared to the shit that's in the atmosphere. It's, it's uh, I mean, people are just, you have to always say compared to what it's in anything. It's 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 really amazing to look at those old, those clips of those old videos where by the 21st century everything will be nuclear powered, no emissions anywhere, and we still depend on fossil fuels for electricity at well sort of in the window where we were supposed to have electric cars, which we do. Uh, Look, the batteries may be mined by child slaves in Africa. We're working on that, but we still need the electricity in the first place, and that still comes from these dirty sources in part, and this is, I think, important to point out, because oil companies decided this was gonna be a huge threat, so they commissioned studies saying that any radiation was harmful, like you mentioned, which, by the way, uh, background radiation is in nature everywhere. You can go in the middle of dead space and you're getting radiated by a star or a supernova or whatever, and it just reminds me of those studies, Oliver, showing that cigarettes are healthy or this oh, yeah, brand of yeah. cigarette is healthier than the other one. It's just sort of the inverse yeah, of that. I mean, the fossil fuel companies have, have a lot to say, uh, have a lot to pay, a lot to be guilty of. I mean, they, mm-hmm. 
who knows how much money they gave the environmental groups because we can't prove that because it's anonymous giving. But you know that they really, maybe it's competition and they just are ruthless. And they, but they knew, they knew in their own studies that fossil fuels were going to screw up the planet. But they knew that from the 1960s studies, 70s studies. We know it from the Chevron, Exxon. It's come out. You know, the papers are there. They knew what they were, were giving the world and they kept going. And they're still going. They owe, they owe a lot. They, they have to, uh, there's a very big problem ahead. Uh, but there will always be a place for oil. I mean, you, you can always make plastics and all kinds of stuff that, I mean, they, they're not going to be run out of business. They, they may lose them uh, if they would lose a lot of their business, but they still manage to be important to many other industries. Uh, so it's not like they'd get wiped out, but... Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, it's greed is greed is real. I mean, it's yeah. just they they probably thought, oh, we'll pivot into this, and then they went, why do that? We're making all this money. It's I think it's sort of these these rather than just think of them as pure evil evil. I really do think that they get ahead of themselves and they think, oh, well, you know, we're going to do this our way, and it just never well, happened. I guess they're, they're, I think the your analogy there. about the tobacco companies is correct, and also the car companies. I mean, with the seat belts and all the Ralph Nader stuff about safety. I mean, they, they, they want to cut, they want to profit and the safety factor always comes in second. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's this old clip of this guy being interviewed on the news and he says something like, they're making us wear seat belts in cars and pretty soon we're going to have, yeah, they're going to be making us do all this other stuff. And it, and it sort of like argues this slippery slope. Then fast forward, I think it was 20 years. There's a guy cracking a beer and he goes, I can't believe they're not going to let us drink while we're driving. This is ridiculous. This is anti-American. And it's just like, if you think drinking and driving with no seatbelt is your car is the way to go, well, in Texas, you might want to re-examine your beliefs on nuclear power as well. I right? remember in Texas when I was, I was married to a Texas woman and and they used to drive around in the 70s with big jugs of, uh, in the car. They had the, the car seat and the, the beer was in the uh, container and they were just driving. It was funny. Cold 45. It's so cr crazy to think about somebody driving with a 40 ounce of malt liquor just in the middle of the uh, console. Yeah. Uh, I, I can imagine the ads so, now with larger cup holders to so hold the, larger bottles of booze. The right to be American. Yeah, the you right know, to be American. Well, exactly. actually, I always liked that a bit when I remember when Thomas Zaz, the philosopher, argued on TV in the 70s. He said, you know, we have the right to kill ourselves. And he's right. We, it's, fundamentally, it's a libertarian right. If you want to commit suicide, you should. You could do it, you know. You, can, you, you don't have to be respond. You know, you shouldn't be disallowed to take your own life. I, I think we have, a, I, th I believe strongly in right to die laws. And I think we have to have more in this country. But uh, that is an American right. But killing yourself by heart, killing others first yeah, is, say, is what's dangerous. If you fast forward it on yourself and you have a reason, I understand. I don't want it fast forwarded on me because you were yeah. thirsty on and the way the home. Same goes for smoking because right. the tobacco, the smoke kills other, hurts other people. It, it, yeah. And that's how I look at, that's how I look at the fossil fuel industry in many ways. And I'm, not saying there's no place for fossil fuels anywhere in the whole world or any petroleum products. I'm not trying to paint this as black and white, but when you look at the numbers, it just doesn't make sense. 4,000 deaths from Chernobyl, the lar probably the largest nuclear disaster in history, 4,000 deaths from Chernobyl. That includes cancers down the line from exposure. 500,000 global deaths annually just from coal. It's not even close. And people are gonna ask, that doesn't even count outdoor air pollution from cars that kills something like 4 million people per year. So and, yeah, what about the waste from oils, oil, oil wells and all the shit that they put in the air? Right. The, yeah. The, there's also chemical, the chemical damage to the, to our landscape all over the world from oil is, is huge. People don't admit it. They don't see it. And they go on about radioactive waste, which is the most supervised of all. You can fit all the radioactive waste we've used up to date in, inside a Walmart. You know, it's high, highly supervised and it decays. Within 40 years, 99% of it is, is, is toxic, toxicity is gone. And then it's buried in, as you know, concrete casts, it, water. Uh, and then it's also uh, underground, the, the Finnish, Finland and and uh, Sweden are doing remarkable achievements in underground uh, storage, putting it in 
and we can do the same. The military has been doing that for years too, uh, our military. But yes. in other words, we're making a big deal about it compared to what? What's, what's climate change? That is horrible waste and it's, right. and it's ruining us, right? Indeed. People will say, and I, I kind of knee-jerk reaction would also say, wow, well, every bit of nuclear waste is tracked by the industry and protected. I don't know. That still seems scary until you realize that the waste from coal and oil is in the air that you're breathing right now and is pumped out essentially haphazardly from every factory power plant and vehicle on the road. Even if factories and power plants have filters, your car really kind of doesn't, it doesn't scale down. Gas, well. Pipelines. Pipelines yeah, leak it, all along the line. The leakage. It, it, uh, right. Yeah. From your stove all the way back to yeah, the well, the stove that and, thing right. is leaking. And like you said, all the nuclear waste, all spent nuclear fuel from the United States, which is 20% of our energy generation, from what I understand, over the last 60 years, all of that is what fits inside the Walmart that you mentioned before. So it's really a uh, just minuscule amount. I mean, you... The average human has thrown away probably more crap over the course of their life just in terms of plastic bags and stuff that's gone in their kitchen garbage than all of the nuclear fuel ever spent. Younger people States. like you are the ones who are talking about this. I'm, this was conversation was not possible a few years ago. Now, I'm not an expert. I was, I was, uh, I believed that nuclear was bad when I was younger because it was, you know, people like Ralph Nader and Jane Fonda, I looked up to them and I still do. But, you know, uh, the, uh, the problem was that there was no consensus for, for nuclear. You didn't have any, the lobbies were terrible. They didn't really advertise themselves. The only people who could have really said something were scientists. And many of them uh, didn't quite understand what it was. So there was a, not a, you know, Wyoming has, uh, has its coal uh, industry. Uh, uh, Texas has its oil. So they all have consensus. They have a, they have a following. It's very difficult for nuclear. That's why I wanted to make this film, to help it. This is one of the few films that talks about nuclear energy. If you look at all the movies that are ever made from the beginning of time, they were horrible. You know, uh, all the horror movies of the 50s I grew up with, uh, uh, even up to uh, X-Man. I mean, everybody, you get bit by a radioactive spider, you become <laughs> Spider-Man. It's, it's bullshit, the whole thing. They make radioactivity into the most dangerous thing in the world. And it scares people. That's what the movies have done. And they continued with Jane's film, nine, nine, uh, Three Mile Island. What was it called? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I can Google it. Jane Fonda. It? Yeah. It was a good film. China Syndrome. China Syndrome. And Silkwood. And don't forget Chernobyl, the uh, HBO series in 2015. Scared the shit out around the world. It was seen by everybody. Again, vast exaggeration. We went to Russia to visit Rosatom. We got a lot of information from them. They're very good, Rosa Tom. There's a 250,000 man agency, man and woman agency. They do a lot of good work around the world. They, they export quite a bit. And they're probably the best in the world. France has an agency, a uh, public agency, China. You find that most of the, the best way to really approach nuclear is with some government public control, public uh, responsibility uh, because we put it in the private hands in the United States, Westinghouse and General Electric. Westinghouse went bankrupt. General Electric is still doing it, but they, they make much more money from oil, coal, and the other things. So they build turbines and they build all the, the good stuff and they have a small nuclear contingent. They're doing good stuff. They have a, what they call a small modified react, a small modular reactor coming up, uh, with Hitachi, the Japanese firm, and it'll be out on the market within three, four years. It looks good. It can be used very well, but it's still small. It's not producing the same kind of gigawatts that the big ones do. And, uh, but it's still there. But it's all private is what I'm trying to say. The government is yeah. trying to, they have the Department of Energy in this country, and they, they help. They, they, they have helped a lot, and all the presidents have been, the last four presidents have been for it, I, uh, from Bush on. So, I mean, but it's not really putting the amount of weight that we could do to make this happen on a big way.
Right. Yeah, we have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy, but we don't have the same thing like Rosatom or uh, France's agency where it's just like this is a priority for national security. It's just kind of it, it more regulates and the maybe Nuclear inhibits. Regulatory Commission has not actually has not given any go ahead to anything in 60 mm-hmm. some years. I mean, they are really bad. They're more of a res- if if a government agency is going to be like, let's say the FDA, you could criticize the FDA because there are many issues, but they 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 promote new drugs, which is has led to many improvements. We need more of an FDA kind of approach to let this thing happen, and they make it very tough for the smaller for the smaller companies. That's why they they get smaller because. Uh, people don't want to invest big money if they're going to run into the F- into, into the N- the regulatory commission. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy the Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. Nuclear plants, they produce something like 100 times the power of a solar plant per whatever acre, per square foot, however you want to measure it. But there's nighttime, there's winter, clouds, they make solar impractical. Nuclear reactors take up something like one-fifth of the space. Wind produces more than than solar does, but it's only still about a quarter of the capacity of nuclear. And I did a little bit of math, and I think this is also in your film, you need 4,000 turbines spread across the land and plenty of wind in that place to equal one nuclear plant. And I don't really know anywhere where the wind blows across that big of a piece of land 24 seven without interruption. I don't think it exists. And don't forget the other problem because what's the backup for renewables? The perfect partner that's been advertised is is, uh, gas. So they Mm -hmm. put gas in, it's an easy backup and that's methane and it gets out in the air. So it's not a solution. It's putting more shit in the universe. the nuclear could be a backup. It certainly could be, and it can be worked out. There are all kinds of issues with the grid. Every grid is different. Uh, obviously, India has a different grid than uh, Denmark. You know, one's wind, one's solar. So there's all you know. There's all, a lot of variations on this, and you cannot make a uniform rule. But we have to think about the world. I would say, generally speaking, if you could maximize solar and and wind, if you could and really get it going as much as possible and get a good backup for it, you could get maybe 25% total of the energy we need in the coming future by 2050. If you, that 25%, and nuclear could cover easily, uh, 50%, easily, along with hydropower. Of course, a lot of countries still have hydropower. So these, are the mm-hmm. most, these, these are the most practical solutions, like combinations of this. And of course, there's new new energies are coming. We are doing new things. And I try to show that at the end of the film with all the stuff that nuclear is capable of uh, cre- uh, breaking up hydrogen, using hydrogen to make, uh, to, to bring uh, liquid, liquid fuels into the business. So nuclear could be combined with hydrogen to make liquid fuels for airplanes. As, as the scientist at Idaho National Lab was saying, it's very interesting developments if possible. We have to go all out on nuclear. We have to use it. It's a magic energy. As Einstein and Marie Curie and Fermi said, it's a magic energy. We've got to be smart about it. It's got uses everywhere. Uh, it's, it's the primary solution. Uh, sun, air, sun, wind, sea. We could, we could, we could take all the, uh, the, the salt out of the seawater. You know, and we can use, amount, use massive amounts of water available. And above all, uh, Earth, Earth being nuclear to me. So those things, those four elements will solve climate change. It would not be an issue even if, if we had gone ahead with the Eisenhower program and the Kennedy program, but we didn't. As Asia modernizes, so India and China as well, they're going to need something like, well, we, I should say, as a planet, are going to need two to four times the current amount of power that we use now. And the question... Yeah, yeah. The, the question is, will it be clean? Because if it's not, we're no way, in yeah. deep trouble. Yeah, two to five times the electricity. I wouldn't say the power because 
uh, electricity. We have to electri elect electrify everything we can. That's part of, that's why we're doing the cars now. That's very important. But uh, mm -hmm. some of this stuff like fl liquid, uh, liquid uh, transportation fuels possible in the future will we'll never, will never, uh, will come through other means. Will come through development of the uh, hydrogen and nuclear, I believe. Yeah, the film shows a lot of really interesting nuclear innovation, smaller reactors that are modu modular and they kind of could potentially scale yeah. down to fit in a, a an office building and have a reactor Everywhere. underneath. Everywhere. Uh, it's really interesting. And so you can scale the stuff way down or way up as needed. In, well, we will be able to in the future, which I think is fascinating because you can do something remote, just like we do with submarines, right? There's a nuclear reactor in there, powers the whole thing, the aircraft carrier, same yeah. same deal. But don't forget, um, uh, just one thing, one caveat mm -hmm. is just nuclear reactors on submarines are enriched uranium. They, the mili oh, they they're, they're military enriched, yeah. Oh, I didn't not, know that. They're not, uh, they're not civilian usage. That was part of Rickover's deal. But Rickover did cross over and give us the first, Admiral Rickover, gave us the first civilian uh, nuclear reactor at Shipping Port, Pennsylvania, which was not enriched. In other words, you, one leads to the other. You can, uh, what can I say? I, I feel that, Well, I, I can't say. I'm sorry. Lo lo lose your train of th thought. That happens to me every day. Um, I will. I'll, I'll rescue this one. So nuclear power in, developed in the first place. How this developed in the first place was submarine reactors. You mentioned Admiral Rickover, Rickover yeah. uh, Hyman Rickover. He came up with the design, I think. Or, I mean, I shouldn't say that. He came up with a plan to implement the design. He was the I, engineer. I actually don't yeah. know. He was an engineer. Oh, so he may have actually come up with this. Started off with submarines using nuclear reactors, which I did not know were were different levels of enriched uranium, and then civilians. So, so nuclear actually started at what you would consider small scale in air quotes because military it was for usage, use on yes. one particular ship. It yeah. was the military use. Right away, they used it for military purposes to build the bomb. I mean, mm -hmm. Oppenheimer and all that. They, they got the the Los Alamos project. Uh, but the Navy uh, uh, used it, uh, the same kind of fuel, to make, not bombs, but to make submarines uh, run for 50 years. But, uh, and then he crossed over that knowledge, I'm saying, in the shipping port, Pennsylvania, by 1958, when he opened shipping port. He did a great job, and he brought everything in on time and on budget. He was a tough, tough taskmaster, one of the best we've ever had. We need good people. It has to be handled well, and he did a great job of safety. Uh, every, anybody who worked with Rick Over will tell you that he 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 beat his officers up and made them really f good people. And they were he. We have a great nuclear force. We had one, and people who worked. I, mean, I know people who worked with him on that, and they were tip top people. But now you know we lost that generation, and. We're getting them back. We, we have to train a new generation. That's what's going on now with all these startup companies. Yeah, it, it's really kind of exciting to see because I, I, I hate to say it, I almost counted nuclear out completely, especially in my lifetime. I just thought there's no way... Uh, I know China's building a ton of reactors. I was kind of hoping that might scare the rest of the world into catching up, uh, provided we don't see a nuclear disaster in China to re-scare everyone again. Well, uh, uh, even if we did have a disaster, you know, what's wrong with that? It, it, that's how progress is made, you know. Uh, the Chernobyl... We Just were, from a psychological perspective, though, of people going, ah, see, it's always... Yeah, I well, mean, that's what I mean by that. That's the problem. I mean, if you have one airplane crash, you're going to give up on the airplanes? You know, you can't do that. You have to have a stick to it approach. Obviously, you want to avoid accidents, but accidents are part of the game too, you know. So, I mean, when you say one nuclear disaster in China, it's not likely to be a, a, a bomb type thing because it's not enriched. It's, it's more likely to be like a Fukushima, which was a hydrogen explosion, a hydrogen explosion, not a nuclear explosion. The only nuclear explosion was at Chernobyl, and that was because they didn't have a containment structure. And they, as a result, the low-level radiation spread all through Northern Europe. That's what led to the 4,000 assumed deaths from cancer. Uh, but we learned from Chernobyl, but we, didn't, we shouldn't have shut down. That was the problem. And the Soviets didn't. They moved on, and they kept going in there. They've developed a uh, breeder reactor, which I saw it in the Ural Mountains at uh, Belyarsk. It's an amazing reactor. It eats its own way. It uses its own waste to, uh, to make more. Uh, more more energy 
So it's <laughs> it's a it's a state of the art. It's too expensive for the market, but it's certainly a breakthrough reactor. And they've had that since the 1980s too, 90s. Uh, they've done amazing work. Russia and China have to be commended for that. And instead of attacked as enemies, I think we could have, if the world is really the biggest problem in the world, I believe is climate change and it's not uh, ideology or territorial f fighting or Ukraine, this, that. It's really about climate change. They are our natural partners, natural partners. And we could, well, they have to if be. we had yeah. stayed friendly with them instead of this Biden approach, I think we would have had the possibility of breakthroughs on a faster level than now we're going to go slower because it's the nature of this world. Uh, yeah, it's very hard, but I, I consider it just to sum it up. I consider it like a bit like a Cinderella story. You know, remember the story, the fairy tale, sure. Cinderella is the ugly sister. They put her in the back, <laughs> mopping the floor in the kitchen and the ugly sisters go out there and preen and pra and they want to meet Prince Charming. And finally at the end of the tale, Cinderella emerges as a beauty. She's been buried all along. This is what I consider to be nuclear energy, is the beauty of this. She's the Cinderella of this thing. So nuclear energy just needs a pair of glass slippers. That's right. I forgot the word <laughs> glass slippers. Well, it's it's been a minute since you've read Cinderella, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I mean, me too. I do have little kids, so I, sh I, should, I probably got a copy in the living room. I, people are going to say, yeah, you mentioned Fukushima, but what about that? I watched the film, of course, and I did some research on this. To clarify for most people who aren't that familiar, most damage in Fukushima was caused by a 100-foot tsunami from Japan's strongest ever earthquake, at least in recorded history. And the plant had pretty terrible design. The seawall was less than 20 feet high. Generators were all on low ground, which is a great idea in a tsunami area because they flooded with water and stopped working immediately. So the plant lost power, which helped the reactor melt down, um, which may, essentially a meltdown means Means overheating, no cooling from water that was pumped in from the generators. And like you said, it wasn't the nuclear fuel that exploded. Hydrogen gas build it, built up, and I assume that stuff was pumped out and ventilated or something normally with the generators. That wasn't happening. That then heated and exploded, which blasted nuclear fuel and other radi radioactive material into the air. But of note, other nuclear plants in the area were just fine because they were designed differently and the generators kept working. So the death toll from Fukushima was actually zero from nuclear and the tsunami itself had 18,000 victims. Yeah. And that still resulted in Japan shutting down almost all of their nuclear plants, which is yeah, not- they, they panicked, yeah. Yeah, they panicked. They, they checked out all the Japanese afterwards for, year, for years and nobody, nobody died from radiation poisoning. Uh, so here we go again, you know, the, the sensationalism. And then now still, you know, with the tritium, the water that they want to discharge in the Pacific, generally speaking, they're ready to do it and the scientific organizations have okayed it. But there's still this sensationalism from the environmentalists who say, oh, tritium is going to screw up the ocean. This is nonsense. Um, several, what is that? I don't know what that is. Tritium is a wastewater that the, it was part of the wastewater that was, I, I'm not a scientist, but... They put it, They want to put it in the ocean, which is where it belongs. And you could drink a gallon of tritium. S several people have told me this. You can drink a gallon of tritium. It has the same effect as eating a banana, which is the same amount of radiation. But they've made it such an issue by sensationalizing it that they they balled it up. Now they, the Japanese have still not released this tritium into the ocean. I see. This is wastewater from Fukushima. Yeah. Tritium. Yeah, I'm Googling this, and it's very sort of low-level... Stuff I understand that the uh, need for an abundance of caution, essentially, because it, you, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. But also, it's just from a science literary literacy perspective, you really do need to decide what you're going to panic about. It, otherwise, we're not going to see nuclear supersede fossil fuels in our lifetime. I, I mean, maybe as fusion gets closer, people will realize we've got really no other choice. Yeah, I would I just love to see. I wish we could bring Einstein back or Enrico Fermi and see what they'd say. What idiots, you know, they, they'd be saying, what yeah. a historical tragedy this is mm -hmm. that you let your ignorant people lead our society into this restriction where you cut off the, uh, what Prometheus gave us. You know, this is a gift to mankind, a gift. Use nuclear well. It's part of the earth. It's part of, the, it's part of what we have. It's the greatest, frankly, the greatest uh, uranium is a, is a gift. And I wish... 
well, I wish that we had intelligent people to lead our society, but we don't. We have uh, people who, the scientists have not made a, a case for it that is, they certainly for it. You know, they're certainly pro-nuclear, but they, I've talked to a lot of them in MIT and at Harvard. And, uh, I, I, I Somehow they're not getting through because I think there's a general cynicism about science too. I think that people will say, oh, you know, I, I have my own conspiracy theory about this. I think scientists are this and that. It's true. I think there's a lot of, uh, too much of the superstition is in the air. Well, I yeah, I think which science... doesn't. They, of course, they'll blame me, but you know, that's <laughs> for but you know, on the, on the Kennedy case, I just want to re refer to that. Uh, you know damn well that Mr. Biden on the night of Friday, the July fourth weekend, closed down, stuffed those files, stuffed that in action. He he illegally he illegally killed off the uh, JFK Records Act, and he said, which was the, the power was given to Congress to open those files. Not to and he and Biden took it back and basically said CIA and me president are going to decide what to release. Yeah, the, I don't know much about this. You mentioned it at the top of the show. I I know that we. I don't want to get in trouble for asking you about this because I was told essentially not to go off the nuclear topic, but I'm going to do it anyway unless Dixon chimes in and says uh, you're not allowed to interview Oliver ever again if you talk about this. So he can tell me after the show if I need to edit this out. But I am curious what this is, because I, I wasn't paying a ton of attention to this. Right. All I know Nobody is they was. were set to release some of these documents Nobody about the was. Kennedy assassination, and they didn't. There's about uh, more than, some people, I don't know exactly how many, I, I was told 4,000, other people have told me more, far more. And a lot of it's about the CIA and a lot of these people, we know what they want. We want questions answered about which CIA, these CIA agents were working with the Cubans, this, that. And we, there's a name, there's names, Joannides, there's a bunch of them. And uh, people want to know more about them because they play into the the connection with the Cuban operation uh, to liberate Cuba. And I mean, you you know that all that was concealed from the Warren Commission by Dulles, who was on the Warren Commission. Dulles was the head ex head of the CIA. He'd been fired by Kennedy, and he said basically he never told anybody on the Warren Commission that there'd been all these plots against Castro prior to Kennedy's death. So, I mean, you have to understand there's a lot of linkage there. There's a lot of reason, motifs, there's motives to kill Kennedy because there was a lot of dislike of what he was doing in Cuba. He wasn't prosecuting the war against Castro the way the radicals wanted him to, uh, which is a lot of, and, and, well, opens up a whole lot of issues. But the point was that Biden said, no more, nothing's coming out. Why? This is 70 years later, right? 70 years? Is Roughly 60 yeah, years, I'm sorry. Now. We're on the 60th yeah, 60. anniversary. Huh? 60 years later, oh, everybody's dead. I, you, know, you have to ask yourself, what is the danger? What are they scared of? Okay, uh, embarrassment. Yeah. Okay, they, let them be embarrassed because the CIA did screw up numerous times on this case. We know that they had a relationship with Oswald for three, four years. This was a significant, and that he was on their radar. They knew all about him in Angleton, the counterintelligence chief, knew about him and kept files secret from everybody else too. There was a lot of a lot of cloak and dagger stuff going on, and I think some of that could be embarrassing. And maybe you know, but there's never going to be a document that says you know this happened and it doesn't work like that. But we know that the embarrassments. What the hell, man? This is what it's about. This is what Congress intended: transparency on these issues that are 60 years old. This is what's disgusting. Nobody, and nobody's been able to pick up on it because he did it, he did it very surreptitiously on that Friday night. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't love stuff like that, of course. Uh, I think anything that sort of circumvents our system is usually he did a it. terrible he idea. He broke the law because he yeah. said no more. This was an act of Congress, by the way. You cannot do that. You cannot undermine an act of Congress and say it doesn't apply anymore because the CIA and I are going to decide what we want to release. By the way, I, I meant to ask you this because it's such a it was such a bizarre little thing in the film in Nuclear Now. You mentioned uh, you're in this French nuclear plant and they said, oh, the water's hot. Don't lean over the pool. Keep your cameras away from over the pool. But why, what happens? Why, are they worried about something falling yeah, they don't want into for, they, the pool? I, I believe I, mean, I didn't really get into it deeply. I, I, no. I, I, they don't want foreign materials falling into that pool. 
Yeah. But it's just cool. Is it just cooling water? I don't get what that even it is. It cools the water, yeah. But they don't want anything coming into it. That's why I asked if I could swim in it. Yeah, I, I saw that. And then they, they left. But I'm well, of course, you don't want to swim in it. But what really is it? And is it like, oh, your camera strap falls in there. They got to send a guy in a suit down to go get it. Is that yeah, what I happens? Would, something like that, I imagine. Yeah. Or I'm else if I, if I was that. wearing suntan oil, you know, it, it, they have to keep that. They want to keep it as pure as possible. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. You don't want a corroded part in a nuclear reactor that you no. didn't find out about until later on. That seems like a bad idea. Although yeah. we have a lot of corroded parts in uh, sun panels everywhere. and uh, Well, yeah, I, I just mean from, from a safety perspective, it's probably a really bad idea to have a, a, a camera, a lens cap floating around in a cooling pool. <laughs> Oliver Stone, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I really appreciate it. Nuclear Now, we'll link it in the show notes. Well, thank you, Jordan. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to you. You're very smart. Thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com, where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube is not the only place that you can check out The Jordan Harbinger Show. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you will find access to our shows that don't appear on YouTube, like Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, even lawns. To find out if they're back by science and logic, or if they're just complete nonsense. Spoiler, many of them are complete nonsense. Also, our Feedback Friday shows where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. And every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Life can be hard, yes, but we are here to help. And if you appreciate how we help, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.